Under normal circumstances, I would be greeting you from the Great Hall. The Great Hall is this beautiful, well-appointed living room that in some ways is the center of warmth for Laity Lodge. But here in the spring of 2020, we are not in usual circumstances, and so I'm greeting you from my home. Uh, the video that follows here in some ways emerged from uh, a retreat that we were looking forward to with a particular group of people. We've been hosting gatherings of professional filmmakers for the past number of years, and two weekends ago, we were to be together with them, and we were so looking forward to it. But like every other event across the country, we've had to cancel that and think about uh, reconvening at a different time. Um, but whether or not you are part of that particular group, or you're a longtime friend of Lady Lodge, or perhaps uh, this is your first exposure to Lady Lodge, I just want to say that you're welcome here and that we're so glad to have you a part of this experiment and this uh, very brief experience together. We have a very good friend, uh, Ian Cron, who tells a wonderful story about visiting his spiritual director. And after complaining about something in his life for some time, his director eventually stopped him and said, Ian, this is your life. These are the terms. What is the invitation? I love that story, and I've told that story so many times. And I feel like we are now in that moment, all of us, but organizationally, your organization and ours is kind of asking ourselves, um, what is the unique invitation to us in this moment to do what we do, but under new circumstances and conditions? So the video that follows is in some ways an attempt to respond to that invitation. We went back to the specific people who were supposed to be a part of that film retreat, and we asked them if they would consider creating something that we could make available here, uh, whether that's a song or a conversation or a brief reflection or even some art. And we're very grateful that all of uh, those friends that we asked said yes. And so what is to follow? is uh, what they are offering to you through this medium. Uh, you know, it's worth saying that at Lady Lodge, at the beginning of every retreat, we're always aware of the fact that people show up in absolutely different states of mind and heart. Uh, some people are doing great. Others are barely holding it together. Um, and we assume that that's also the case in this moment, uh, this cultural moment that characterizes our entire planet, um, finds all of us in various uh, stages of anxiety or hope. And it is our desire that uh, whatever happens here in the next few minutes can be a source of encouragement for you. You know, one of the things that we also say at the beginning of every retreat is that we have an agenda, but we don't have an agenda for you. By which we mean we have a program, we've kind of prepared, but we don't have an expectation for what the experience of a retreat needs to mean for you. And so it is with this program, with these next few offerings, uh, there's no particular expectation of what it needs to mean for you, but we're just glad to uh, have this time to be together. Um, we've been thinking about this actually in terms of a visual postcard. And if you think about it, a postcard doesn't really have very many ambitions for itself. It is there to express to the recipient that you care about them, that you miss them, and that you can't wait to see them again. And I just want to say on behalf of uh, your friends at Lady Lodge that we miss you, we care about you, and we cannot wait to be with you again. We'll see if maybe we can create some other opportunities like this, but for now, we are so glad to be here with you, and we offer uh, these voices to you. This, uh, this little hiccup we're in, I think, is meant to be something maybe other than what is obvious. A little bit of a, hello, anybody in there? 
it leaks into our uh, personal space in a way that's uh, infuriating. I haven't seen my little kiddos for three weeks now. My, my lifeblood. I mean, it, it's hard to tell. I don't think God creates calamity. On the other hand, seems to know the right time and the right place. Man, I never dreamed that I would get to go to Lady Lodge. I'd always heard about it, my friends. And I just lived in mystery for so many years. And then, lo and behold, God saw fit that I could go and be a part of the community there. Pretty amazing. What a great, what a great memory. And what a pleasure to get to go back time and time again. Oh, <clears throat> okay. I get what I'm doing. This, I'm just gonna wreck it. That's it. That's the river at the bottom. Yeah, and the sky at the top. Nice. Texas. This is Texas Hill Country. My dear friends, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. My name is Vito Ayudo, and I am filming this right after Palm Sunday, which was a time that I had been looking forward to for a really long time because Palm Sunday weekend, I had planned to be at Laity Lodge with some really lovely people, thinking together about God's place in our work and in our world and getting to do it in that really sacred space right alongside the Frijo River. But I didn't make that trip, none of us did. Instead, I'm filming this in my bedroom in Brooklyn, New York, and there is a river about 100 feet that way, uh, the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. It flows faithfully day and night, which I think is probably the only thing that it has in common with the Frijo River that I didn't get to be there this weekend, that none of us did, is a real loss. And I know that in the context of everything that's going on in our world right now, that relatively speaking, that's a small loss. This is a time of really profound suffering, of sickness and death and grief. And so not getting to be there is a small loss. But I also think that these smaller losses that all of us are experiencing right now, missed meetings and not being able to stop by a friend's house or not getting to meet someone for coffee or not being able to give them a hug to smell their neck as you depart, all these smaller losses are accumulating on us too and they're really heavy. I'm a pastor and I know this isn't the right way to think about being a pastor, I know it, but there's still a part of me where I think that I'm supposed to be somebody who's wise, that I am supposed to be somebody who can dispense wisdom to other people or counsel them through really difficult times, but I don't feel wise right now. I don't feel like I have any wisdom for anybody else. I don't even feel like I have much peace for myself. I wish I was a person who had a lot of wisdom to share, and I wish I was a person who had peace for myself, but instead I found myself being really anxious. I found myself being a person who gets short with his son, who gets up early in the morning and reads a bunch of news reports that just makes me more anxious. I'm having trouble sleeping, and I'm scared, and I'm sad, and I'm confused. 
There's the story that I keep thinking of from the Bible. It's been a story that's been important to me for a really long time. It's at the end of the Gospel of Luke. It's the story of two disciples who are scared and sad and anxious. They're walking away from Jerusalem and they're walking towards a place called Emmaus. It doesn't really matter where they're walking to. What matters is what they're walking away from. They're walking away from Jerusalem in the aftermath of two really profound events. One of them is Good Friday. They've seen the crucifixion of their friend, the one that they put all their trust and hope in. They'd seen his crucifixion, his death. They're walking in the aftermath of that. But they're also walking in the aftermath of the resurrection. They'd been told that the stone had been rolled away, that the tomb was empty. They weren't sure what to make of it. And so as I've thought about it, those two disciples who were sad and confused and anxious, they were walking in deep paradox. And what I mean by that is this. In that moment, they were walking in an experience, a felt experience of God's absence in their life. Again, they just seen the crucifixion of their friend. Not only the tragedy and grief of seeing somebody that they loved tortured to death, but also all their hopes, personally and for the world at large, all those hopes were as shattered as their friend's body. They were still gonna have to live in an occupied place. They're Jews living in Roman-occupied Jerusalem. That means that racial and religious oppression is gonna continue to be a reality in their lives. And so in that moment, as they're walking away from Jerusalem, they are walking in a felt experience of God's absence. But at the same time, is that they're walking in God's absence. And here's why it's a paradox. At the very same time, they are walking in an experience of God's presence. God is walking with them. It tells us in the story that as they're walking, sad and confused and anxious, that Jesus comes alongside them. They don't recognize him. They don't know it's him, but he's there with them. He joined them, which Jesus often does. He has a habit of doing that. You read through the Gospels, he has a habit of showing up at places like the funeral of a mother's only son or coming alongside a man who cannot walk and who doesn't have anybody to help him or being present when a woman is accused of sexual sin by men who are in charge and who are preying upon her. So Jesus has a habit of being present to people who are sad and anxious and confused and are in trouble. So those two disciples, they're walking in paradox. They're walking in an experience of God's absence, but also they're walking with Jesus in his presence. And it seems to me that that's where a lot of us are walking right now. We're all walking there. That we're sad and anxious and confused. And right now we are walking in an experience of God's absence. Right now, all of us are. We are seeing people who are sick and who are dying. We're seeing people who are facing economic hardship, and it may be us, it probably is. And we live in a country where the suffering and the death and the economic hardship is not indiscriminate. We are all suffering, but it's the poor and it's racial minorities who are gonna face the brunt of the storm. They already are. And all of those realities, they are an experience of God's absence. There's just nothing else to say about them. We have to say it. It's not blasphemous to say right now that we are in an experience of God's absence. It'd be blasphemous to say otherwise. Because the Lord Jesus Christ did not go about in his ministry making people sick. He went about healing people. The Lord Jesus Christ did not go about equipping oppressors to put people in their place or to bring up divisions between people. He came to proclaim good news to the poor and to set the captives free.
should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion. So we are living right now in an experience of God's absence, but at the very same time, we're walking in paradox too. Listen to this. This is true. We are walking in God's presence too. We are walking alongside our Savior, even if we can't recognize him. If the Christian faith teaches us anything at all, it's that Jesus promised to be with us even to the end of the age that Jesus walks with people who are sad and confused, people who get impatient with those that they love, people who can't sleep at night, people who don't feel like they're wise and don't feel like they have any peace. Our Good Shepherd, your Good Shepherd, walks with you when you're beside green pastures and still waters, and he also walks with you through the valley of the shadow of death. So we're walking in both of those realities, God's absence, but also God's presence. But I don't need to tell you this. It's a lot easier to see and feel and experience God's absence. It just always is. I don't know why it's the case, but it's always easier to feel the despair. And it takes courage. It's going to take courage for you to look for God's presence in your life right now. Our default mode is always to despair or to apathy. And when you get pulled in that direction, we all are going to, it's okay. Because Jesus is even present with people who can't see him. That's the way it was for even those disciples. They had known him and seen him and they still didn't recognize him. They still couldn't perceive, perceive that he was there with them. So it's gonna take courage for you to do that, to be able to look and see where he is present. 
Here's the last thing. The question then is, how are we to see Jesus in this time, this time where it's so easy to see the absence of God? How do we see God's presence? How do we see the presence of Jesus in our situation? Well, in the story, I'd encourage you to go read it today. Luke 24. It's long, but it is good. They don't recognize Jesus until the very, very end of the story. It says that they get to the place where they're going. Jesus feigns as if he's going ahead. They invite him in and he says, okay, sure. And they go in and they sit down at a meal. And it says that Jesus takes bread and he breaks it and he gives it to them. And we're told that he is then known to them. Their eyes are opened. He's known to them in the breaking of the bread. That's how they come to know him. That's how the Bible tells us that we begin to see Jesus even when it feels like God's absence is what's most pervasive. We come to know him through the breaking of the bread. And theologians and Bible scholars have been thinking about what that means for a really long time. And some of the most prominent answers as to how Jesus is known to us in the breaking of the bread are ones that you might know. Like when we get together in worship, when people come together and break bread and drink wine and remember the presence of Jesus among them. That is a great way. The Eucharist. Another way is when we get together and just break bread together in our homes, sharing a meal with one another. What's really hard about the time we're in right now is that neither of those things is very available to us. Not communion, not getting together with people, we're in exile from those things right now. And so it might be even harder to see Jesus because we don't have those ways of seeing him in the breaking of the bread. But here's what we don't have any shortage of whatsoever. We don't have a shortage of broken things right now. And the Bible says that Jesus is known in broken things, the breaking of the bread and in broken hearts and in broken bodies. God makes himself known in broken things, in broken people. He makes himself known through people who are broken and to people who are broken. I really believe that. That's true. And so if that describes you, if you feel broken right now, my prayer is that you would experience Jesus through your own brokenness, through the brokenness of the people around you and in the words of Nicholas Waltersdorf, I'm going to read something to you now. Blessings to those who mourn. Cheers to those who weep. Hail to those whose eyes are filled with tears. Hats off to those who suffer. Bottoms up to the grieving. How strange, how incredibly strange. These are qualities of character which belong to the life of God's kingdom. But why does Jesus hail the mourners of the world? Why does he cheer tears? It must be that mourning is a quality of character that belongs to the life of his realm. Who then are the mourners? The mourners are those who have caught a glimpse of God's new day, who ache with all their being for that day's coming and who break out into tears when confronted with its absence. The mourners are aching visionaries.
in 2016, I published a book called How to Survive the Apocalypse, which has turned out to be um, accidentally very appropriately titled. But one thing we talk about a lot and think about in the book is how um, the meaning of apocalypse historically and in narratives has not really been the end of the world, but rather the end of a world of an era, and that it's a moment of revelation where we see things that we couldn't see before because life was covering up reality. Um, so I've been talking to people about like what kinds of realities they've been discovering, but I'm also curious if there's anything, especially in your conversations with people in the industry, that you think this is revealing about like broken places in the film industry, things that need um, to be healed, um, or places of challenge and opportunity, justice and injustice, that kind of thing that you've you've been thinking about or seeing. You know, we are cynical people, us humans, in, uh, by and large. And I was so prepared for the cynicism of, I can't be with my wife and kids anymore. I can't be with my family. I'm going to want to kill somebody. And sure, we all make those jokes. And like, but <clears throat> the amount of people that I've, so, you know, all of my me all of our meetings now are Zoom meetings. I'm sure yours are the same. Yeah. And so um, I'm I'm on the Zoom every day with people. A huge majority of those people are really, really grateful for the time they have and are recognizing it in the moment. Seem to be at least they're saying that and they're recognizing the value of this time, the recognition of the need to rest. Mm the recognition that they had not been resting, mm -hmm. that they had been going 900 miles an hour, like I had too, like we all have. Um, I've been surprised at how many folks, people that I know for a fact in their former lives were like sometimes actively not being around, you know? And when they're forced to be around, I think you're given a choice. We were all given a choice at the beginning of this enter in or pull out, you know, ret retreat and make things worse or seize the day, you know. I often am working via Zoom anyhow, even in normal times, because my the team I work with is so distributed. But I think for a lot of people, they're realizing simultaneously that they would rather be working with people um, because we're humans and we're not just like commodities to be sold and traded and stuff like that we're like actual people um but also they're seeing the human side of people's lives too like mm -hmm. kids yeah. walking through and having to arrange i've seen a lot of bedrooms yeah. I've seen a lot of bedrooms the last uh three exactly. weeks exactly <laughs> but it's kind of um you know obviously the we have the luxury of working in it industry that makes that possible for us and not everybody does but um but it has been i think a blessing to me to to like remember that people aren't just who they are at work but they're also people with lives and um totally. and that's a thing we sure forget in the film industry all the time my dear friends the lord bless you and keep you Lord, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace.